Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad that you are here. Uh, pardon me? It's stuck at 11 seconds. Yes, I know. But that's okay. Um, we have arrived at a time when we don't have to wear masks. We can actually have coffee. Coffee's on the back. Uh, it's great to be able to, to be together again just to worship. Amen? Um, for those of you who are online, welcome. I'm glad that you are with us. Uh, today we are going to be having communion, so I just want you to uh, know that. Also, uh, if you put any comments down as you're going along, even if you have questions, I'm just going to encourage you. If you have questions that you want to uh, put down or if you want to say something about the message or something that I say or anybody says, uh, I just want to encourage you to put it down and I will uh, go online uh, starting probably this afternoon or, this, or tomorrow. I'm going to go online and I'll endeavor to answer any questions or to reply. So um, just so that you know that... Uh, Kelly's not here today. She's off. She told me she wasn't going to be here. I just, I just get told what I'm doing, and I just kind of, one of those things. That's okay. Um, you know what? What a great day to be together. We're so thankful for the rain. You know, that hot, plus 36, 38, that's hot. And uh, so to get some rain and on, the, on the land sure does refresh everything. Well, this morning we're going to just start... And we're going, to pr we're going to be praying this morning for the Cowboy Church. Now, the Cowboy Church, Dan Zimmer, he helps out with that uh, church, but he's going in for open heart surgery. So they've asked if we could pray for him, and it's going to be somewhere in the three to six weeks. It all depends on what it opens up. And also pray for the leadership of the church that God will move where they are now. See, they had to move over to a different, I think it's in Arbutus Hall now. And so they had to move. And, and sometimes when you move location, it really freaks people out. They just kind of go, oh, now what am I going to do? It, it's just a different location. But it's hard to change. And so, yeah, the change of the chairs is kind of like, where do I sit now? But you know what? We're going to pray for the Cowboy Church, that God would just move by His Spirit in that and touch lives. You see, you see we're here with a purpose. And that purpose is to see souls saved. And that is what Cowboy Church, what they're going to be doing. That's what uh, we just want to pray for them in that. And so uh, I'm going to open up in prayer. And as I do, we're going to get the worship team to come up. And um, then Mickey's got a special announcement about next Sunday, um, just so that you are aware. All right? So let's just pray together. Father, we just thank you again just for this morning. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that, Father, your Holy Spirit would be here. And I pray, Lord God, that you would give us ears to hear, Lord, what you would say. I pray, Lord God, that you would open our eyes because, Father, we can't do it ourselves. We need you, Lord. And by your Holy Spirit, that you would uh, speak into our hearts even as we worship, as we uh, hear your word, as we have communion. God, I just pray, Lord, in it all, that your name would be exalted. And, Father, we pray together for uh, the Cowboy Church. And we lift up Dan Zimmer before you. And Father, as he's preparing to go into open heart surgery, we know that so many things can take place and, and fear can settle in because of the unknown, the unexpected, and we're not sure what's going what's to take place. And so God, we pray for him. And we ask you, Lord, that your peace that passes all understanding would guard his heart and his mind. That Father, that he would know that you are with him and that whatever takes place, you are there. Because, Father, that's what brings hope and that's what brings peace into our lives. And so, Lord, I just pray for him. Lord, that you would help him today. And, Father, as they move into a different location and as they welcome people back, Father, I pray that you would uh, draw them in. Lord, that you would uh, bring those back, Lord, who, has, who have been uh, missing for the last year and a half, that they've had to be closed. But, God, that you would just bring them back. And that, Father, that in that time as they worship, as they have uh, their service, that God, that people would be drawn to know you. Because Father, it's all, that's the important part, is people would turn their hearts to you and accept you as their Savior. So Father, we pray for that today. We pray, oh God, for your strength for them and wisdom. And Father, we do pray for the other churches of Rocky. We pray, Lord, that you would move by your Spirit. The Father, that those that have been um, gone for the last, haven't been on 
back to church or they've been on and off. But God, we pray that they'd start to come back because, Father, there's a time when people can worship together. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just come and that you would bring them in and that, Lord, that the churches would uh, rise up and be the witnesses, Lord, that you've called. That, Father, that you would uh, awaken the church once again in this season of our, if, of our lives, Father. This season and this time, Lord, awaken the church to be the light and the salt that you've called us to be. Now, Father, we thank you again just for all that you're doing. And Lord, we commit this morning into your hands. Be exalted in this place, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, just want to quickly remind you guys about the camp out uh, next weekend uh, before we start singing here. Um, out at Hank and Don's, uh, if you need directions, get a hold of the church here this week and we can get you directions to it. Um, Friday nights, the 50th anniversary celebration for the happy couple. And, uh, oh, they, they look mad. Maybe they're not happy. But anyway, uh, <laughs> oh, they're smiling now. Okay, good. All right, they are happy. Excellent. That was going to be an awkward Friday night, i got to be honest. Uh, but um, they're going to do a, there's a beef on a bun and a supper there. Uh, anytime kind of after 4.30, right, Don? After 5? Okay. So anytime after 5, if you want to come out to that. And if you want to bring your trailer out, any day this week, Hank will be waiting outside all day from <laughs> 6 in the morning until 10 at night to direct your trailer yeah, to where it needs to be at right. any day this week. So, No, but we want to. I just want to remind you, if you're coming as a family group, bring a watermelon, please, because we're going to have a watermelon feast on um, Saturday. And any yard games you got, bring those. And if you're just coming for the day, what, sorry, Dessert Friday night. Bring a dessert as well, please. Friday night. Man, the list is getting long. It's getting long to remember. Um, but bring yard games. And then remember, you don't just have to, you can't, uh, if, you're, if you're camping or not camping, it me, you can, how am I going to phrase this? This is not working out too good. You don't have to camp to come. That, that's what I'm trying to say. You can come out Friday night and just hang out and then go home. Because it's only about a 15-minute drive, 10-minute drive to Rocky. Like, it's not very far. So, Come out all day Saturday. Come out all day Sunday for the potluck and the morning service and that kind of thing. If you need a ride, let us know. We'll come in and get you. Um, but there's quite a few who are staying out there, which is great. But if you do come for the day, come prepared. Uh, you know, I hate to say, I, I'm not trying to be your dad, but dress appropriately for the weather. <laughs> Bring sunscreen. There'll be outhouses available, right, Hank? There's going to be outhouses out there. So that's covered. So you're welcome for that. And, uh, but yeah, come prepared, bring, you know, some food and that kind of a thing. And otherwise we'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. It's all good. So, well, let's, uh, let's stand and let's make a joyful noise to the Lord this morning. Thank you. God.
distraction, Lord. Yes. Anything that may be on our minds right now, God. Anything that may be troubling. Anything that would take our focus off, God. We make a choice now, Lord, to lay those down at your feet, God. We want to engage with you this morning, Father. In Jesus' name, God. We lay those things at your feet. Lord, if it be your will, would we not pick those things up and take them with us again? Would they be laid down and you can deal with them, God? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. We will sing, sing, sing and make music with with the heavens we will sing, sing, sing. 
set the captives free the same love that opened eyes to see is calling us all by name you are calling us all by name the same God that spread the heavens wide the same God that was crucified is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by Been 
Every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. for for online 
hopefully the people online can see. Uh, we get to have communion like we've had before where we just can come up and, and uh, we're just going to do a little bit different in this. Is that uh, the group on this side is going to come to come from here to here and the group on this side will come and take it from here. It just makes it different, <laughs> I guess. Um, but you know what? We're here to celebrate. I don't know if you, if you, you listen to the words of these songs. So often we, listen, we, we sing the songs, but we don't really hear. And that, that, that song just before um, about the love of God, and, it, and there's something that is going to be spoken of today, and I don't want to get too, I don't want to jump too far into the sermon, but there's something that I want to challenge us with about that love. And it's going to come up. But I want, you to, I want you to have ears to hear. I want you to listen. Truly listen to what is going to be said. So we're going to be singing this next song. And it's uh, what is it? Hallelujah for the Cross. And as we sing this song, Hallelujah for the Cross, we're going to, you just can come up, just file up and, and grab uh, these, the cracker and the juice. But I want you to remember that this is for those who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if, they, if you've accepted Jesus, it's not just because if you're, you know, well, if you don't belong to this church or whatever, it's about coming to the table of the Lord. It's God's table where we come and we celebrate what he's done. It's a celebration of life because he gave his body and he gave his blood for us as a celebration. Can I just, before we do that, just let me tell you, I, I was able to go back and I, I, I was remembering this and six dimensions of, a com, of communion. And this is, I'll just tell you, we look backwards. We look back at the finished work of salvation. What did Jesus do? He died for us. That, we look back at it. We look forward to the time when we will enjoy this whole time and we can be with Christ. We look inward. We say, God, what's going on in my heart? We need to look at our hearts and say, God, forgive me and my sin where I've failed, where I've walked away, where I've done things, God forgive me. And his blood covers that. We look upward. His resurrection is the foundation of our faith. That we too have been raised with him. So we set our minds on things above. We look upward to what Christ has done. And then we look around, needing each other to help to stay faithful. And then we look outward to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There's, different, there's six different parts to that. And I think that as we experience and as we know the love of Christ and we can celebrate, we, we celebrate the life that he's given to us. But in the, the next step is celebrating here, but it's going out and telling others. Because you see, we've been saved. We've been taken out of brokenness. And Jesus would say, would you go back? and tell others? Would you tell them that there's freedom from this brokenness that you're in? We can't just hold it to ourselves. We need to be telling others. We need to be sharing that very same love that set the captives free. He set us free. We need to be sharing that love to others because Jesus paid the price for our sins. Amen? Amen. Well, uh, let's sing this song. And as we do, just come right up and we'll grab the, the, the cracker and the juice, all right?
Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not, cause with your blood you, you bought my freedom, hallelujah for the cross, all my shame was met with mercy, now your mercy will be my song. And oh, the glory, oh, the power of the cross. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. Because with your blood, you, you bought my When we have communion, we always go back to 1 Corinthians 11. And the importance is, is that we are reminded of what was written and what was is because our faith is built on Christ and through his word and that we can remind ourselves. And Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you on the night that he was betrayed. I don't know if you've thought about this, but let's just walk backwards and see that night that Jesus was betrayed. Knowing what was coming, knowing what was going to take place, he still continued. He said, Father, if this cup would pass, let it be done. But if not, your will be done. So Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's just pray. Father, thank you for your great love that was seen as you sent Jesus, your son, to die for us. And as we take communion this morning, 
We thank you that it brings us life, that, that the body of Christ that took and bore all our sin and exchanged it for us so that we might be stand righteous before you, O oh God. We thank you for the body of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for caring and taking our sin on the cross for us. He says, take this bread and eat it in remembrance of me. Let's eat. And then in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is a new covenant. We have a new covenant with Christ. We have a new covenant that we are able to come into the very throne room of the Lord. We're able to walk into the throne room, not because of our righteousness, but because of what he's done for us. Is this the cup of the new covenant in my blood? Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of of me. Let's take and drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you declare, you tell the Lord of the Lord's death and what it does in your life until he comes. Let's remember and we're going to sing one more song and, and then we're going to go right into the word this morning. You call me from the grave by name. You call me out of all my shame. I see the old is past.
sin and darkness, but I'm living in the light of your goodness, because you have given us freedom. Sing that again. Now I'm no longer bound by sin and darkness, because I'm living in the light of your goodness. You have given us freedom. Do you believe that, church? He has given us freedom. We are no longer slaves to sin. But bask in the goodness of who our God is. Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. You guys can have a seat. Amen. You know, it's been a long time since I've been able to preach. It's been a whole month. Can you believe it? A month without preaching. That's, that's almost, that's, that's bad. So usually I, I preach between uh, 40 to 45 minutes. And so I figure that if I've got, um, I haven't preached for four weeks, that gives me, what, 45, 90, 180 minutes to catch up on. Is that all right? Yeah, right. He says, <laughs> hey, listen, there's, there's so much this morning that I'd love, to, I'd love just to, to share with you. And uh, I want you to start by uh, turning your Bibles to John, John chapter 13. Now, um, we're not getting there quite yet because in this, this, in this pro process of where we've been with Paul's letter to the First Corinthian church, uh, we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians and, um, and Paul's letter to the, to the church today. What's going on in the church today? And we're going to be stepping into a, a, a place where, um, honestly, I, I'm, I've been convicted in my own heart. And I'm still, every time, like I even went over it again this morning, and it just hit me. I say, oh God, I need your help. I need your help, Lord. Because what God wants to say, what I believe God is speaking to us is, it, it, 
let me bring it this way. That, la that one song that we sing, we sang, he's calling, he's calling, he's calling us to the cross, has huge significance to what I want to share this morning. Huge. And I pray uh, that God would just help us to hear. So we began, uh, before we went into this uh, month of missions, how many enjoyed all the speakers that was here? I really enjoyed them. You know, it just challenges me and just stirs me up. Like Dave Macklin, he says, just say yes. Just say yes. And uh, for, for those who've gone into different missions, they step out and they, they say yes to the Lord. And you know, we may not be going overseas, but you and I are called to be on mission here in our community. And we too need to say yes. Yes, Lord. What are you asking me to do today? Yes, Lord. You want me to do what? Okay, yes, Lord. Pray for my this drug at this drug dealer? Really? Yes, Lord, I will. You see, we're called to be on mission, and we ought to be saying yes. So we started off in 1 Corinthians 12, just before we, we went into this missions month, and we were talking about the spiritual gifts. And we talked about the source of the spiritual gifts, and we talked about the purpose of the spiritual gifts. Oh, I even have PowerPoint here, I think. Yeah. Let's, see if it, if, let's see if it's going to work. There you go. It does work. And we were talking about uh, the fact that the source of these spiritual gifts is the Holy Spirit. That's what it's called, the gifts of the Spirit. And it's a manifestation. It's that, that working out of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer who yields themselves and surrenders their will to what the Holy Spirit would do through us. And the purpose of the gifts were for uh, the common good. It was to build up the body. The gifts of the Holy Spirit were meant for common good, and it was meant for the glory, for the honor, for the lifting up, for the declaration of who God is and what he can and will do in a person's life. These spiritual gifts are about presenting Christ And it's not about you. It's about what God wants to do through you to touch others. And each one as a believer has been given a spiritual gift. But that spiritual gift can only flow freely when you are surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And so what does that mean is we need the Holy Spirit to come and fill us daily. Holy Spirit, come and fill me. Take every part of my life. Take my mind, take my mouth, take my eyes, my ears, my hands, my feet. Take me, O oh God, and fill me with your spirit so that I might walk in a way that honors and glorifies you. We talked about the different gifts, and here's, here's a kind of a list. It says, and this is the one that Paul uses in Cor for the Corinth, the Corinthian church. I'm not going to go to the other ones in Romans 12 and Romans 4, but I'm just going to use the ones out of 1 Corinthians 12. And it says this, it, you, to, to one is given the message of wisdom, the message of knowledge, faith, healing, performing of miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. These were the gifts that were given by the Holy Spirit for the common good of the church. And you know, I, I think we miss it because we don't see it happening within the church on a regular basis. And I'm saying, God, why not? Why are we not seeing these gifts that, God, you've given to us for our benefit, for our good, and we're not seeing it. And I, and I guess on the one side I would say it's because maybe we're just not willing to step out. So I asked the question 
as we come into this next part, what is our motivation behind using our spiritual gifts? What motivates us? What's that, that piece that, that moves us forward so that we are willing to say yes and step out and allow the working of the Holy Spirit to do it? Or what is it that's stopping us from doing it? That's in two weeks, by the way. We're, we're not going to hit that part yet. That's in two weeks' time. This is a two-part uh, message. And next week I have another, I, I have a message that, that, that God was putting on my heart. It, it's just a phrase that uh, Scripture, and it just, it just hit me. And I just said, you know what, I'm going to share that at the camp out. So those of you who are at the camp out will get it live. And those, if you want, you can watch it online here. Scotty will be here, and he'll uh, have it online. Uh, and you can watch it and then come out. But anyways, we're going to get past that. Uh, spiritual gifts are really good. I, I want to get back into line where I'm at. Spiritual gifts are really good as long as we're not doing it for our own pleasure, our own purpose. If we use it for the enjoyment for ourselves, then that spiritual gift is somehow tainted with self. But if the spiritual gift is used for the body, that gift will bring life because God brings life to where we are. So what is the source? And that source is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And, and I know that we've read this scripture for weddings. I've done it. We read it all the time, 1 Corinthians 13. But if you really look at the context, the context of 1 Corinthians 13 is in the very midst of spiritual gifts. So what is the motivation behind the use of these spiritual gifts? Okay, everybody, what is it? 1 Corinthians 13 is a, the scripture about? All right, see? So you already know the message. And as we go through this, as we go through this, cha this chapter, and again, this chapter I'm going to be using in two weeks, and I'm not going to do all these three points, but these three areas that, that is broken down into 1 Corinthians is, is the first all the preeminence. In other words, I, I tried to find one word that would shorten up what I wanted to say, but it's, it's above everything else. It's, it's superior. It's preeminent above everything else, love. Spiritual gifts ought to be used out of love. And when not used out of love, it brings death and destruction. Seriously? Yes. When I serve in the church, and I have a word of knowledge, or, I've, or if I have a prophetic word, and I'm not using it out of love for you, and love for the Father, I'm not representing the very heart of Christ. And does that mean you don't give a hard word? No, no, that's not it. The hard word with, that, that is brought out of love brings comfort and brings help and brings encouragement. It brings change. But a, a hard word brought out of anger destroys. Does that make sense? Love is the preeminent over everything of the, of the spiritual gifts. And then in, in, it talks about the description of love and the, and the permanence of love. But you know, we can't start talking about those three areas until we first stop and understand what this love is. And I know that, that there's been messages that are gone on, and, and I just pray that this either you, this confirms and helps you to understand, and, and you say, yeah, I knew that, I knew that, I knew it, good, I've got it. But there's some other parts to this that I believe that God wants us to hear. Like I said, it convicted me and it just, it just, God, I need your help. Because that love that set the captives free is calling me to give the same love to somebody else. The same love that would go to the cross and die for me. It's the same love that Jesus is saying, I want you to take to somebody else. 
Are you willing? Oh, I don't know. It means I have to die. Die to my own self. I don't know. But that is in the context of, first, of the gifts, spiritual gifts that we have. This love is the word agape. And what does that really mean? We hear of you got the filio, you got uh, eros, and you got agape, and you got you got these different kinds of love. And I know you've heard the messages, and 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 you've heard this what agape a love is. But I want you to hear it again, and I got it up there, and so you can read it with me. It's a commitment to of the will. You, you, you can, you, you can, if you're taking notes, you write that down. It's a commitment of your will to cherish and uphold another person. Think about this in the light of spiritual gifts. And a spiritual gift that is used to uphold and to cherish another person. It refers to an unselfish, outgoing affection of tenderness for another without necessarily expecting anything in return. It seeks a person's highest good on the basis of a decision of will and an inclination of your heart. It seeks a person's highest good. When you serve with your spiritual gift and used out of love, you seek the highest good of the other person. It has nothing to do whether you feel like it or not. It's an act of your will to see the best in that other person. And it doesn't quit. That's that, per that's that permanency of love. There is no end. It keeps giving and giving and giving. This word is used about the love of God always. When it talks about God is love or, or God calls us to love, it's always this word agape. And it's the only word ever used to describe his love. You want to know about God's love? It's agape. It's an ever giving for your benefit, for your good, for your growth, for your help. He never looked at it to get back. It was always to give. And that way, then we worship because of that love. We love him because he first loved us. It's a word that is connected to our will. And when we're told to love as God does, it becomes a decision that you make and a commitment that you have decided on to treat another person with concern and care, with thoughtfulness, and to work for their best interest. That's what love is. And that's the kind of love that Paul is talking about, even with the use of your spiritual gifts. Now, do you know that there is an enemy to this love? Do you know that there is something that would rise up against that love and try and stop it? One of the most deadly enemies of the Christian cause in using agape love is this. You ready? It's phony love. The greatest enemy to this love is this phony love. And let me, let me give you an example. Oh, Tim, you're such a good man. You know, I just really, ex I just see you as, as just full of what God would do. You know, Helen, you know about Tim? He's just weird. You know, he said, do you, do you get what I'm, do you see what I'm saying? Is I'll say one thing before him and I'll talk about him behind his back. Phony love. Phony love turns around and speaks to one person and tells them things that they want to hear and then the other side turns around and destroys them. That's not the love of God. And yet it happens constantly in the church. We're not even talking the world because we already know it's, that happens all the time in the world. You know, we always talk about you later. 
We always do those things. This love that, that's phony is self-seeking. It's irritable. It keeps a record of wrongs. It finds joy in believing the worst of somebody else. Okay, don't lift up your hand. But how many like to hear the gossip that goes on? Oh, did you hear about, oh yeah, really? No, that couldn't be, oh, really? Oh, man, that's juicy. And we fight. And that's why Paul said in Romans chapter 12, and, and you know how much I really love Romans, but it's also part of our set in our um, core values as a church. And I'm using this because I think we've forgotten what the core values are. A core value is something that you go back to when everything else seems off and it's not working. We go back to a core value. And that core value is Romans chapter 12 and it starts at verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. It needs to be without hypocrisy. If it's just for a moment, if it is an attempt to put on a facade to act like you are kind, thoughtful, and gracious, and faithful, and so on, but it all disappears as soon as the situation changes, that will spread death. So all of a sudden, I, 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 we, we allow, you know, we're all okay right now, and then all of a sudden something happens. And it's so easy to take offense. And from that point on, whoa, man, we're going to just, you know what? Let's go back to the core value. Love must be sincere. Do I love that person enough to continue to walk through and believe the best for them? Do I love them enough as I serve them with this spiritual gift. So what does God say? What does God speak to us about these spiritual gifts and, and working in love and, and that? And that's why, we're on, that's why I told you to go to John chapter 13 because we're going to be in, in the book of John for the next little bit. And I want to give you this in John chapter 13 and verse 34 and 35. It says this, I give you a new command. If you've got a Bible with red letters, let me tell you, Jesus said this because it's in red letters. Just saying. I give you a new command. Love one another. Verse 34, just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. You know, if I stop there and we just took just everything that I've said up to now, And heard Jesus say, you know, that agape love, <laughs> I meant it. And I want you to love like I've loved you. The same God that opened, how did it go? The same God that was crucified. Pardon me? Set the captives, set the captives free. The same God that set the captives free. The same God that opened eyes to see is calling us all by name, love each other as I have loved you. For this is how the world will know that you are my disciples. All right? Now is the time to say ouch or amen. Because you see, that same love, is it working out? Because that's what Jesus commanded. Love one another the way I've loved you. But God, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they said to me. You don't know how they acted towards me. Love. How did Jesus love you? Even while we were yet sinners, even while we were rebellious and didn't even bother seeking Him, He loved. You see, that's why I'm struggling with it myself because I'm going, God, you tell, you tell me to love and I'm going, but I need your spirit. I need your help, God, because there's too much of me 
in the midst of it. Within this context uh, of this verse, Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. And Jesus knew that the Father had given, him, had given him everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. And in this place of knowing who he was, the Son of God, he washed the disciples' feet. He washed Judas Iscariot's feet. He knew what was going to go on. And you know, you, you think of, of Peter. Oh no, don't wash my feet. You can't wash my feet. Boy, he was humble, right? And actually, no, he wasn't. That was full of pride. Because you see, I don't know, has anybody, have you ever had somebody wash your feet before? How did that make you feel? Like, seriously? You're going to wash my feet? No way. But there's that self-sufficiency. Oh, you're not doing that. You can't. I can do it myself. But it's that place where you have to die to self to allow something like that to take place. It's just weird, by the way, to have somebody washing your feet. I had it done, and it's just weird. But I'm just saying that, that we, we got to understand this. Jesus, knowing who he was, in the knowingness of all that was going on, even with Judas Iscariot, all that was going to happen, Jesus went and washed the disciples' feet. This kind of love. Actually, after he told them this, he says, For I have given you an example, in verse 15, of chapter 13. He says, I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. Truly I tell you, a servant is no greater than his master and a messenger is no greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This kind of love that we're talking about in regards to spiritual gifts is possible only to those who have first experienced and know the love of God that God has for them. You see, you cannot use these spiritual gifts out of love until you have first understood and experienced this kind of love for yourself. Have you experienced that from the Father? Even after you've done something that is just so sick, so wrong, even before you came to know him, and you realize, you've come to this realization, God, how can you love me? Look at what I do. Look at my way I live. And yet he loves. And he says, I want you to use those spiritual gifts with that same kind of love, knowing that that person may take that foot that, they, that you are washing, may kick you in the head later. Not in the butt, just kick you in the head. You know what I mean? Do you, do you, those are phrases, but I think you understand what I'm saying. Knowing that that same person, but he says still, to love them. He says, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Serve one another out of the overflow of knowing who you are and your experience of his love. We had communion this morning. And as we have communion, you, you, you recognize this love that God had for me that took him to Calvary. So that I might have a relationship with the Father. He took my sin and gave me his righteousness and took my sin on himself. That same love. He says, now I want you to love others. Just as I've loved you, love one another. A willing giving of all that you we are for the highest good of another. If that's not enough, I want you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and I'm going to read verses 9 to 17. And I want you to listen 
to this and, and, and just you, you read along and, and just grasp the, the, the greatness of what was being said. Jesus says this, as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I told you these things so that, you, my, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Have you ever thought about this joy? And you wonder about this joy that some people just don't have is because they're not following what Jesus told them to do? This is my command. So that phrase, I'm just going to go back to verse 9. It says, remain in my love if you keep my commands. Now, this is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I've called you friends because I have made, you know, I have made known to you everything I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit. That fruit is the outcome of the command, which is love. To produce fruit, and that your fruit should remain, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. What an incredible promise. This is what I command you. Love one another. Did you hear what he said? Let me walk through a couple of these things with you. As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Spurgeon said this. He says, Beloved, you cannot doubt the love the Father has for his Son. How many of you have ever doubted that? Do you think God didn't love his Son? He hated him, right? No, he loved him. And he showed, he, he, he showed his son what was going to take place. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We see this through scripture. The father loves the son. As the father has loved me, I also love you. It is one of those unquestionable truths about which you never dreamed of holding an argument. Our love would have us place his love, our, sorry, our Lord would have us place his love to us in the same category with the Father's love to himself. For as much as the Father loved the Son, so we are loved. That's huge. Think about it. Really? Yeah. But he says, and he goes on, he says, abide in my love. Abiding or remaining is a simple act of obedience. If you keep my, my commandments, you'll, obey, you'll abide in my love. And what was that command? Love one another. That was his command at this point. This is what Paul was, was, was Jesus was saying. This is the command. Just you want to remain in my love? Love one another. Oh, It's a command to love. Sometimes, you know, we, we, we think, okay, this command for love, we think, well, maybe instead of us loving, sometimes we think it's, uh, we should compete with one another or we just should dispute one another. Or maybe we should quarrel with one another, right? Because that's what happens in the church. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what Jesus told us. As disciples, we're called to love. And this is how the world will know that we are his disciples when we love one another. And he says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you. 
When the disciple fails to abide in the love of Jesus and thereby fails to keep his commandments, that disciple will not experience the fullness of the joy Jesus promised to those who walk in obedience. So, how much joy is in your life? When it comes down to spiritual gifts, are you using them out of love? Then there must be joy. If you are not experience the joy, then you must go back and say, why am I not experiencing the joy? Am I not using my spiritual gift? Or am I not using my spiritual gift in love? Or what? I don't know. You have to determine. You have to ask the Lord, what is going on? Why am I not experiencing the joy that you promised if I'm not walking in obedience? Because he said, my joy will be there. Another um, commentary, and he, he said this, and I thought it was so important enough to, to read it to you. No one is more miserable than a Christian who for a time hedges his obedience. He does not live, love sin enough to enjoy its pleasures and does not love Christ enough to relish holiness and walk in obedience. He perceives that his rebellion is wrong, it's iniquity, but obedience seems distasteful. He does not feel at home any longer in the world, but his memory of the past associations uh, and, the, and the lyrics of his old music prevent him from singing with the saints. He is a man most pitied, and he cannot forever remain in that state. You see, the one most miserable is the one who knows what he should be doing and doesn't. But he feels He's just somewhere in the middle. So what does it say? Start loving. <laughs> you want your joy to come back? You want to find this fulfillment? You want to start to see things taking place in your life? Love one another as I have called, as I have loved you. This has nothing to do with whether you feel like it. It's an act of your will. But start to step back. Where did you lose your joy? Where did you lose it? Then he says, no greater love than this. There's nothing higher than that kind of love that Jesus is about to show us, that he laid down his life for his friends. There's no greater love, no greater love than this. His love was complete. But then he says that he laid his life down for his friends. Okay. He laid his life down. That means Jesus died. But this life does not just mean the body. And here's where the kicker comes in. He laid his life, that's everything that you are inside your will, your desires, what you feel is important. Remember, he's calling, he's calling, he's calling us to die to self. He's calling us to death to ourselves. I want you to love others as I have loved you. That means he gave up every right that he had. He gave up himself for you. Now do the same for the others. Oh, Lord, I don't know. You don't know what they said. Oh, yes, I do. You don't know what they did. Oh, yes, I do. You don't know how much it hurt. Oh, yes, I do. Love. You see, this is the command. This is what comes with the spiritual gifts, is to love. Wow, I didn't, I didn't sign up for that part. But it's the truth. We've, met, we've moved this 1 Corinthians 13 to weddings. And between husband and wife, which is true, but we forgot about the fact that it's for the spiritual gifts in the church. And we wonder why we don't have the joy of the Lord. It's because we're not walking in His commands to love one another as He told us to. No man can carry his love for his friend farther 
than this for the one who would give his life all that he is for the other. I give up my selfishness. I give up my pride. I give up my desire for my own wants and I'm going to love out of a, out of a heart of commitment for that other. And then he did this. Here's, here's the part. He says, I no longer call you slaves, but I call you my friend. The word friend here, and I, let me just, let me just, in thinking of the ancient world, the slave could be, could be a useful tool. A slave is a tool and a trusted, a trusted tool, and I don't know if that's a good way of calling you a slave, it's just a tool, but you see, they were just used. And they, they could never be thought of as a partner. And I looked up this way, so I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, this is what I read and this is what I learned, and, and, and it, it hit me. But he called us friends, and he says, you're no longer a slave, you're no longer looked at as just a trusted tool, but one who is a partner, a co-laborer, a co-worker with Christ. It was possible that maybe a slave and a friend might be in similar help, but a friend could be a partner in work in a way that a slave could never. You, see, you and I are called to be co-laborers as a friend with Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Co-laborers. You are a friend because he tells you. He takes and he shows you and he tells you what's going on and he can help you and he leads you. You see, that's what a friend is. It's not, oh, Eric and I are friends. Well, that's fine. But when Jesus calls you his friend, you are a co-laborer with him. Did you hear it? Do you catch the importance of it? You're working right alongside with Jesus. You're going to be just like Jesus here on this earth. You're a co-worker. Really? Yeah? Yeah? You're my friend. They were friends because they were obedient. Remember, if you obey my commands. Friendship with Jesus can't be disconnected from obedience to his commands. Again, Spurgeon said this, it must be active obedience. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Some think it's quite sufficient if they avoid what he forbids. Abstinence from evil is a great part of righteousness, but it's not enough for friendship. In other words, just staying away from what is evil? No, it's walking in obedience. It's not just about staying away from the things that are not right, but it's loving one another as I have loved you. Do you see why? This hits home and I'm going, oh God, I don't know. I need your help. They were friends because Jesus didn't keep secrets from them, but openly revealed what he had received from the Father. A friend is a confidant who shares the knowledge of his superior's purpose and voluntarily adopts it as his own. He gives up himself. He says, okay, God, it's not about me. It's what you want. Okay. We come to the conclusion. You're saying it's about time. Two scriptures. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Pursue love. Desire spiritual gifts, but pursue love. In both of these instances, Paul is encouraging his readers, first of all, to imitate God. Be like Christ. Love as God loves. 
And secondly, to pursue love. To pursue is to run swiftly in order to catch a person or a thing. To run after, to press on, figuratively of one who is in a race, runs swiftly to reach the goal. Paul says, I press on towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. To seek after eagerly, earnestly, endeavoring to acquire. Pursue love. I want us to take a moment, and we're going to be singing this last song here right away, so Mickey, if you want to come. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to look at your own life. Trust me, I've been there, and I've done that too. But I want you to ask yourself, does my life imitate God in this area of love? Does my life imitate God's in this area of love one for another? If the answer is no, then God forgive me. We repent and call back to God. God forgive me and help me. I need your spirit to help me to do and to love as you love. And the second question I want to ask is, I want you to ask yourself is, am I pursuing love or have I stopped and pursued selfishness? Have I pursued those things that were different than this love? Have I looked at destroying somebody rather than loving This is an ouch nor amen section. <laughs> you get what I mean? Lord, what's been in my heart? Remember I, I said, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open our eyes and open our ears. I hope that you heard this. And that the Holy Spirit showed you in your own life and that we would be willing to surrender. And say, yes, Lord. So as we come and we're going to sing this one song, let's thank God for his love for us. Oh, we need to worship and say, thank you, Lord, for such a great love for us. That you've called us here, friend. And let us pursue love and be imitators of God. Because he first loved us. Let's stand and let's sing this last song together.
hear the Father calling you, calling you by name. He says to love one another as I have loved you. Father, today, Lord, you are working in our lives and you've called us as co-laborers with Christ. As co-laborers, we're called to go and to love one another, to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. You told us to love one another, and God, we need your help. For Father, we failed in so many ways. But I thank you for your forgiveness, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that you give us your spirit. You dwell within us and that we walk in resurrection power. You've given us the ability, the power to be able to love. Oh, God, help us to die to self so that Christ might be seen in us and through us for your glory and your honor that people might see who Jesus is and what he does. God, today, we again surrender our lives to you and say, God, come, have your way in us. To you be the glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Calling us all by name. 